So welcome to this Active Building Centre hosted COP26 fringe, fringe event in association with Stroud District Council. I'm Chris Bryer, the Active Building Centre's Business Development Manager. I'm proud to say I've got a great panel of four experts here with me today to discuss the topic of what is the role of the public sector in leading net zero. So we have four members of the panel. We have Dr John Furley from the University of Gloucestershire. We have Martin Searle, the former Police and Crime Commissioner for Gloucestershire. We have Doina Cornell, the Labour and Cooperative Leader of Stroud District Council. And we have Max Wilkinson, the Liberal Democrat Climate Change Emergency Cabinet Member at Cheltenham Borough Council. Thank you to my panellists. So then, we've heard a lot over the last couple of days and the last couple of weeks with regards to net zero and the challenges we all face. And I'm sure in Glasgow we'll hear a lot more as the world gathers in the Scottish city. So what is the role of the public sector in leading net zero? I'll start with you first of all, Doina, as your association with this debate. What's your view of how the public sector can lead the net zero? Thanks, Chris. Right, you really put me on the spot with. Thank you very much. I need to choose my words carefully because I've got our chief exec and director of place here as well. I'm obviously a very integral part of the project that we're running as a district council. So I thought um, this is a huge topic, isn't it? So I thought probably what's best is I give you a bit of a, a flavour for where we are as a Stroud District Council ourselves and a little bit of the wider context because you are asking us to talk about the public sector. It's not just local government. And then so a little bit about what next steps are and where we're going now. So I mean, just as a district council ourselves, the path that we've been on is we were the first council in Europe to become carbon neutral back in 2015. So you know, we, we all know, those of you who live within Stroud District well, what, what the character of, of this place were and, and the environmental expertise that has been in this area for a very long time. And as a local council, we've been able to um, draw on that. And I think we've also been informed by the fact um, we're quite an unusual political makeup. We are made up of Labour, uh, Greens and Lib Dems. We've been running the council in that way since 2012 and we work very closely with our Conservative um, colleagues as well. So there's very much a cross-party consensus on that. Um, I thought I'd give us a few practical examples on our path so far and, and having started from that basis of becoming a carbon neutral council, um, we declared an emergency, a climate emergency in 2018. I think we're the second council in the country to do that after Bristol. Um, and on the back of that, you declare an emergency and then you very much think, well, what happens next? So then the work had to begin to get the sort of solid policy and plans in place in order to actually start to work through the system of how you deal with an emergency. So what, what we did was we created a very detailed strategy um, which was adopted back um, last year. We were able to do that even in the midst of the pandemic and sitting below that is a very detailed action plan. If you want, to, I can't go into all the details now because like, it's a huge document and has a, a huge amount of detail but I think um, it, that's the framework which has been created for us as a council and right at the heart of that when we talk about public sector's role in getting to net zero was a recognition that as a council we're only responsible for a tiny amount of the emissions um, in the district and also we are are um, only able to do a certain amount but we can be a really powerful force as an enabler for whoever else is within our area whether that's public private sector community groups as well so that um, is quite a, a key key recognition for us and um, just to give you an example of sort of how the sort of practical measures will fall out of that that strategy just um, in the last month or so we've adopted a plan to decarbonize um, our 5,000 council homes to get them all to um, the level of, of um, EPCC so that there's a huge amount of data and work that's been done so I think what's interesting about local councils is that we very much are practical organizations and we take the ideas and we want to turn them into practical projects so that's an example um, of how we've got 5,000 council homes that we need to do the work. We've done a huge amount of data and crunched the, the, the information to understand what would be required. And we had various scenar scenarios of different costs. We came up with sort of the middle road in Wales, what we could afford. And that's going to be an investment of £180 million over 30 years. Um, so that's quite a significant investment. Um, on top of that, we're doing about £3 million investment um, e in e each year around sort of you know building up in insulation and making those homes fit to live in. So that's one practical example of something. Another one is we're just about Ebley Mill, you may be familiar with as council building um, right next to the river. Um, we're going to have a water source heat pump that should go online um, quite soon within the next month or so. <coughs> that's an example of how we can be an example to the community and we're actually working with a local company. So also embedded in all the work that we do is around how do we encourage the local economy, how do we support um, local enterprise um, so that we can sort of be that, that active part of our community. 
um, and another thing there's been a lot of talk about planning and building standards um, over this um, during today and uh, we've got a process of reviewing and adopting a new local plan and embedded in there are some really high standards around zero carbon and how we can get that into the system it's going further than the national policies currently are we're taking a bit of a risk because we don't know if we're going to be allowed to proceed in that way but that's the way local councils are going so those are just a few examples of some of the things we're doing and there's a lot more talking about the public sector we're working with one public estate so we've now got some funding from government to work with um, health police and all the other public sector within the Stroud district how we can build some extra capacity around that whole decarbonisation agenda and skills has been talked a lot today how do we build that that those skills the capacity into the local economy um, so just as I've said um, uh, around the fact that we can't do it on our own, how do we create that sort of that partnership is really important. And I think the other really important thing that um, a council like ourselves and the public sector bring to the table, which probably others can't, is that we're very much about place and we will look at the communities that we represent and we will create solutions that very much focus um, on them. And, and we look at things very much in, in a holistic fashion as well, I think. I mean, I think today the theme has very much been around construction and the built environment and that's a key plank of our strategy, but we're also looking at the, the <coughs> ecological emergency and how okay. we can enhance biodiversity. We're looking at social justice as well, another key aspect of our, um, our strategy because um, it can't just be about sort of what people can do who can afford to do it. It's also how do we bring up those people, for example, who might be suffering from fuel poverty, which is something that's very topical at the moment. So how do we look at it in the round? So that's sort of where we are as a district council. I think very briefly, because I'm sure I'm, I'm running out of time to speak about all of this, the wider context is across the country, every level of local government are engaging with this and every, you know, w whatever sort of um, level of commitment they've made, Every council, regardless of their political colour, many of them have declared climate emergencies and many of them have got really well-developed plans and putting really practical projects in place. So there is collectively across the entire country, and we cover every, every single place, street by street, we are in every community, um, there is a political willingness to do the practical work that is needed to get us to those absolutely essential goals, which is to get to the reduction of our carbon, um, reduction of our carbon emissions. And as I said, we have to see that now in partnership with the ecological emergency as well. We cannot look at those two things separately that's also extremely important so that is the context that you've got you've got that incredible will across and I speak to council leaders of all political colours across the country and that is something that we very much share um, and, and that's really significant because that goes on to my final point that I'll make which I've, I've written but I've got two big buts down here so the but what are the difficulties <coughs> what are the barriers and I think that's one of the things that you wanted to address which we may also talk about a little bit in the debate obviously we've just had the government has published its zero carbon strategy this week which is really significant I took some time to go through it. It's about a 300-page document. I think I got to about page 200 <laughs> where before I found a sort of reference to local government and what our role might be in this absolutely crucial challenge. And so I think it's great the strategy's there. I don't want to be too political and knock what the government's trying to do. And superficially, it looks fantastic. There's some great headlines that come out of it. When you actually start to drill down into the details of it, I'm quite concerned about how it's going to enable the delivery of what actually needs to be done. And let's face it, we declared a climate emergency. Time is running out for us to get on and, and make those significant steps. So I think what we need to see is um, some really significant practical stuff to sit below that strategy. One example, obviously, it's been highlighted is around the grants for green homes um, sorry for green homes, that was the one that was abandoned, wasn't it, at the end of last year? I mean the one around the um, air source heat pumps. So um, uh, that would be around only a tiny percentage of homes would be eligible for that grant. But what's not been very clear so far is um, how are those hair, um, air source heat pumps going to be um, installed? Who is going to do the maintenance? You know, we've got, um, uh, as a council, we've got the local expertise. I think it's around eight or nine years where we started to install eight air source heat pumps in our own buildings, and we're aware of all the, the challenges that involves. So, so it, are those grants going to be administered by local authorities? Are they going to be administered by, uh, as, as was done with the Green Homes Grant, where we saw that um, scheme didn't really work out, where it was um, by a, an outsourced company that did it. So I think what we need to see is some practical measures and I'm a little bit concerned that um, the detail isn't there. There's some big figures that have been put into that strategy which sound really great but actually when you dr drill down into those millions or billions and you divide it by every part of the country you realise that's not a great deal for every single place that will require that finance. And my other 
two things, and I will finish in a minute, Chris, um, is, um, is it's very much a grant-based system. So what it is, we, we, government is saying we're allocating this amount of money, which sounds great, so it's a nice big pocket mm. of money, but every council will have to, or public sector body will have to bid for that money. So you're on the basis that instead of just saying, right, this is the need, let's allocate it according to your need, everyone has got to put the bids in. So if you're great, you've got a good team, we're quite successful as a council as getting those grants in, but it means you need to do that. So it may mean if you get the grant then the other place doesn't get it. And similarly, I mean, I know this is a, a, a real significant thing for the education section. I think this college where we're based today has suffered about from the fact of that competition-based... Sure, my microphone's gone then. Um, competition-based um, aspect of finance where you end up competing against each other. So this element of competition, I think, is quite difficult. And the final thing, something I've been talking about for a long time, is... If you expect local government to do a lot of the practical work as the actual actors and also the enablers in the system, we have no statutory duty to do any of that. Everything mm -hmm. that we do currently around carbon reduction is, is just off our own bat. There's no, well, there's no funding that comes with that and there's no powers and there's actually a specific line in the zero carbon strategy which says we are not going to put any statutory powers in for government. And there's also a bit of a line saying basically you're going to have to finance this all um, from <coughs> what you've already got. And we're, we're expecting because of the impact of COVID that the funding will be going down for local government. So you can see... I'm nervous about some of this stuff. I think the aspirations are there. The incredible practical expertise is within the public sector. I've talked mostly about local government, but it's certainly within the health sector as well and, and other aspects of the public sector. But, but are we really being given the tools that we need to do the work, which is absolutely essential? I'll stop there. Wow, I think she's uh, done the debate for us. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> questions two and three there. So yeah, a round of applause for Dorina there. Uh, questions two and three about barriers okay. and what you're going to do, so we'll come on to that. I think one of the things you said then, I'll pick up and refer this to uh, Martin Sell, the former PCC, is you, know, you said about all these climate change emergencies being declared and you know, why you know, it's, it's been accepted that it needs to be done. Martin, as, as a PCC for Gloucestershire, you, know, you made it an agenda issue, mm -hmm. not only locally but nationally, the first to do it. Why did you do it and what did you do? OK, thanks, Chris. I think the first thing that the public sector has got to do is show leadership. Um, you show it, you show it, I know, but it's not across the board. You've got to show leadership and you've got to deliver, not just say the words. Um, I could see through climate change, all these issues, green issues, call it greenwashing. A lot of it to me seemed symbolic. We'll have one of these, we'll, we'll, we'll do one of those and, uh, and see how it goes. But to me, and I spoke to a huge number of people about what their concerns were, um, and my area was, was policing, uh, reducing crime if I could. So I have to set priorities, and I set six priorities for policing. Five were directly related to reducing crime, reoffended, all these issues. But number six was what I called a green and pleasant county. You may have called it a climate emergency because the environment in which we work and live is absolutely crucial to a public sector and to the people that we, we serve. So it seemed absolutely right that a police service, a council, NHS, anything in the public sector, if they can't see now we have a climate emergency, um, it, it would be wrong not to make that a priority. And it actually needs to sit alongside their core business now, many people disagree and say, well, we're here to do policing. We're not here to do climate change. Well, one goes with the other because we're all part of the same community. And there is a lot of resource within all these organisations. You know, I don't expect police officers to actually go and deliver the climate emergency. But the structures that sit behind them, and they are vast, and the same within the health service, um, they need to be having that as a priority to make sure that public service is leading by example, is not just being symbolic, and that's what we tried to do with what we call the Green and Pleasant County um, Initiative, Priority for Policing. It had huge public support, um, we'll go on to electric vehicles just, just briefly, is that the public don't like to see diesel police cars or council vans or whatever it is pumping out diesel in front of their children's school. They don't like it. They love the innovation to see a public sector actually doing something that they, they said they would do. And I know the electric cars are a talking point which brings engagement straight away with the public. But you can't do it just symbolically. And uh, when I met Rob Llewellyn on, on Fully Charged, there are dozens of, dozens of examples of organisations who will have one electric car and make a big fuss about it. I think I, think I saw a fire engine had a couple of 
solar panels on its roof. Well, it wouldn't even light a light bulb, yet alone anything else. Very symbolic. I'm not knocking the fire service. That's for another day. Um, tonight, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I shouldn't have said that. Um, so it, it's important. But what we did, we've got to be at the cutting edge. The public sector must be at the cutting edge of technology and climate change. I don't think it should be at the bleeding edge. That's really for industry. We've heard so much about what industry can do, what science can do. But when the technology comes online, we should be at the cutting edge because we say we represent the public, we say we serve the public, and we say we want to show leadership. So as soon as these technologies come on board, we should be at the forefront adopting them, testing them, A, because we have the money to do it, uh, it's important to do that so we can try that, and to demonstrate to the, the public who perhaps don't have the money to do it just how it can be done. So we began uh, our journey on electric vehicles in, in Los Angeles Establi with one, I think, first or second generation Nissan Leaf. Uh, my office drove it. It was a challenge to see if we could get back at night. We took all the, the flack, all the scepticism about if you got a long enough lead, when it was run out, all these things. But we were just testing that technology. Actually, we began with a, uh, something else. It was uh, one that did about 30 miles. Um, forget it, great car. But the moment we, I was on London Underground, I read about the new Nissan Leaf. This one would do over 100, 200, I think 200 miles. So we have got to get into that straight away. So we made it a priority that we would have those in the constabulary. Now, saying it's one thing, putting the infrastructure in place is absolutely crucial because you can't be seen to fail on this. It's not, so the infrastructure is crucial. I wish we could have shared it with other public sector organisations. Why do we feel that wasn't their fault? That's just where we were at that particular time. And we set a target to the constabulary, said 20% of your vehicles need to be electric within four years or three years, whatever it was. That was a big change for them. There is this myth that police cars drive around all the time. They spend most of their time parked up. We put the telematics in to see where they drove, when they drove, and we put an infrastructure in place that meant we could actually do that. And then we set a target for 40%. So at the moment we have 100 vehicles, roughly, but maybe slightly less, which are fully electric. Not one has ever run out. No one's ever had range anxiety. It makes them drive slower. We can see what they're doing because they're in to get in the, ma the maximum out of it. So that's the first thing you do. The second thing you have to do is to keep pushing the envelope because the technology has advanced no, no end. You don't put them on the motorway yet because they haven't got the, they need to run 24-7. But probably most police forces could tomorrow run on 20%, 40% electric vehicles. But they're not doing it for some reason. Why not? I don't know. There is no excuse for it. That's why I think it should be mandated. Not that you should have a certain percentage of vehicles. But every public sector, it should be required in all your decision making, in all your decision making, you take the impact of climate change into account and you demonstrate that, just as the way you would around uh, you know, equ equalities. You have to demonstrate that. One of the most powerful pieces of legislation in policing was 1998, the Crime and Disorder Act, which said all public sector, all public sector, in all your decision making, must take into account the impact that will have on crime and disorder, public safety. It changed the game. And why they won't do that, maybe they will, for, for climate change, said, you know, the health service, MOD, huge, in all your decision making, you must say why it contributes towards net zero. Simple to do, so when you're doing buildings uh, and so on. It's been hugely successful, it actually saves money. Um, I'm not sure if the 40% target left the day I left the building in, in May, I hope not, uh, and if it has not if you start on there for 40%, I'll be having things to say about it. But the downside is, Gloucestershire has 20% of their vehicles are electric, about 100 of them, mainly black Nissan Leafs. It seems we only get them in black when we bought them, a bit like Model T Ford. Um, but we couldn't charge our cars. We went to Wiltshire or to Bristol or to Manchester. It was hopeless. And they're all behind barriers because they all secure buildings. So just before I left, I took the lead nationally for trying to make the police force more carbon neutral. Um, we had all that, uh, and it, 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 it was overwhelmingly supported. The unfortunate thing is I didn't win the last election, so I don't do, I don't do it anymore. <laughs> but that's really, by the way, I have more time <coughs> on my hands now. But it's essential, it's all joined up. What Stroud does is brilliant, so why can't the others do it? Just take the very best of it and make it compatible. 
so much work is safe risk, but uh, I'll leave it there. We'll come back to you. I think you've answered question three, so we're going through the questions. That's okay. Uh, <laughs> <I got laughs> Dr. John Philly is the uh, Sustainability Operations Manager and Carbon Lead at the University of Gloucestershire. So then, John, the question was, what is the public sector's role in leading net zero? University of Gloucestershire is doing some of that, isn't it? Tell us a bit more. Yes. So I suppose I was going to start with the one of, you know, First of all, just why are we doing it, I suppose. So for my answer to that really simply is because it's necessary and I think we have a duty to be doing it. But then it's supported by the fact that our students want to see it, you know, our, our staff want to see it, and it, it's definitely the right thing to do. We, we are currently the number one most sustainable university in the UK in the People and Planet League. We got two years out of that due to the pandemic because they didn't run it last year, so we got an extra year free. But we do take that seriously and we've not just been on this journey for one year we've been on it for like 15 years and we we've done a lot you know before without calling it what we're doing for net zero last week we launched our net zero policy so we're aiming to be net zero by 2030 and that's not going to be simple or easy and i think you know that question around how are we doing it that's where the real trick will be and for us you know it, Everyone's talking great things today and it's focused on kind of the built environment in a way. But for us as an organisation, we know that 20% of our carbon emissions come from our use of electricity and gas. About 40% come from what we procure and the other 40% comes from our student and staff commute. So there's, there's stuff we can spend money on and make the change happen. And then there's stuff that we can influence to make the change happen, I suppose. And, and one of the important things to us is that We've, you know, we've got an estate that consists of currently four campuses plus the city centre Debenhams building in Gloucester that we're going to redevelop, so it'll be five campuses. And we know from some funding we got from the government through Salix that to replace seven of our, seven of our gas boilers costs about one and a half million. And we've got about 80 gas boilers left after that seven are done. So to do the rest, about 15 million pounds. So that, that's in anybody's purse is a lot of money. And that only deals with actually 10% of our emissions. So we've got kind of the, what can we do physically? Then what we can do with engagement. And that's where I suppose for us as an organization, the trick is because we can, we can educate the people that are coming to us for degrees and education. And we, we embed sustainability in all of that. And Ali was talking earlier about the digital space and how we embed sustainability in that. And we, it's in all our courses in a way. And that's an important part of what we can contribute, I suppose, to the, the big word public sector in a way, because we're putting, I always end up saying young people, but most of our students are younger than me, so I'm in my 50s. There might be some that are my age, which is great, but we're putting people out there that have, that have more education, hopefully, when they start, and they're going to get that education in sustainability, and that will include net zero, and they can then go and be those kind of you know, members of the public asking politicians for, for change and for, for what they want, but also know members of companies and, and making businesses doing the right thing so we've got we've got the part where we can kind of almost make a product that, that helps that net zero change we've got the part where we can maybe spend some money or do some internal influencing to make people turn light bulbs off and then we've got the part as well where we can work with you know everybody in this room presumably works in some way for an organization in some way or another you're probably providing some sort of service we use and we'll be looking to come to yourselves to do your bit, I suppose, around reducing your carbon emissions as well. Because actually, you know, you've talked it, we've all talked it, it's actually a big picture and it's about kind of everyone doing their bit. And that's, that's where the trick will be for us, I think. So finally then, Max, you know, come to you at the end of this one. Thanks, Chris. Uh, yeah, uh, public sector role in leading it. Well, in Cheltenham, you've got a, a, a cabinet member for climate change. What does that involve and what's your thought on that, that question? Well, it's always fun going last, isn't it? <laughs> when all of the good points have already been made. Um, so I, I would like to wholeheartedly endorse what Doyne has said about the, the role of councils uh, and obviously um, Martin and, and John too and Martin's role in uh, the police was really important and what he achieved um, I think we would like to think is, is going to be taken forward with our new commissioner. Um, th the way I look at this is it sort of it's in three main areas. It's the things that we can directly do and directly influence. Then there's the things that we can sort of indirectly influence. And then there's the things that aren't within our control. And in the first area, you've got things like the council's estate and our council houses. And uh, I'm pleased to say that Cheltenham Borough Council, since declaring the climate emergency and putting me uh, in the role as the first ever cabinet member for climate emergency in Cheltenham, um, we're bringing forward our first carbon neutral council homes, which is a really 
important and positive step. Um, we are uh, installing some really s in innovative smart metering technology all across our council buildings. So when we've got big old drafty heritage buildings like the Pitville pump room and the town hall and the municipal offices, uh, clearly there's a massive drain on our energy there and we need to be making sure that we are minimising the amount of energy spent. Um, then, there's, then there are some things that we can sort of put in place where it's policies that we can put in place to influence what's going on elsewhere. And that's uh, in terms of our planning policies and our licensing policies. So we're going to be putting in place um, a, a supplementary planning document for uh, environment and ecology, which is going to be really important. Um, Doina mentioned a really interesting point there about how Stroud is going to be putting net zero targets in its local plan. Um, what we experienced in Cheltenham when we attempted that before was that a lot of our policies were struck out because they were... Um, uh, they were judged by planning inspectors as in advance of government policy and that is a key challenge because actually the ambition at local levels is currently far in advance uh, of that that exists at the national level unfortunately. So we find ourselves um, having to push quite hard at the local level. Our supplementary planning document will set really stringent uh, targets uh, and it will, it will be a really important nudge for developers who wish to come to Cheltenham uh, and build things uh, or, uh, or apply for planning permission to do other stuff. Um, uh, and what we will do is use that as a nudge, basically. You'll get a, a better hearing from Cheltenham and you're more likely to get through our planning committee if you're doing the right thing by Cheltenham's environment and the rest of the world too, and that's a really important principle. Uh, it's a way in which we can show leadership. Um, and th the third thing is the bit that we can't do, because I don't think anyone wants the man from the local council or the woman from the local council strolling into their house, switching off the lights, um, telling them they can't start their car in the morning. Now these things, um, this is just not a politically tenable position for councils to take. So we need to help lead that debate. Mm -hmm. um, we need to show people that we can play a role as the public sector at the local level in bringing people together and building a consensus. In Cheltenham we're doing that um, in two main ways. We're launching community grants where if you are a, a, a local, um, a local uh, organisation, maybe you're a charity or you're a school or you're a parish council, you can bid for a, a, some funding from a pot um, which will mean that you can unlock some investment in your local community building or you can bid for a nice little biodiversity scheme in your, in your preschool garden or maybe you can generate some um, renewable electricity on your site. Uh, and these things are really important because that is a way in which um, where we can't directly influence things and we can help others. Uh, and then the final thing that we're doing, which is going to be really important and could be something that's uh, very significant uh, and is a model that can be taken to other areas, is we're launching um, uh, as what we're calling the Cheltenham Zero Partnership. Because we know that we can't tell businesses to do things, we know that we can't just tell people what to do, we know uh, also that there is going to be a huge amount of conflict in this. Um, and we need to find a way uh, to reduce that conflict and build consensus. So the Cheltenham Zero Partnership is going to bring together businesses, the public sector and community groups to share knowledge uh, and to bring forward work streams so organisations and communities um, can work together in a consensus-based way um, on projects that will help Cheltenham reach net zero. Uh, and all of those things are going to be really important I in our approach. So then, Max, following on from that, what do you think the government could do to kind of help and support the public sector in driving the net zero? Sorry, I've gone first here this time. <laughs> Don't worry. Um, I've done it again. Yep. So Leave it on the floor. It's long enough. Um, Take your break. <laughs> yeah. The, uh, well, the number one thing the government could do is give us some certainty. Um, Doina mentioned the fact that all of these pots of funding that uh, are available at government level, um, they're all competitive funds. So um, while local government and most of the public sector has been under huge pressure um, and, and actually councils now get zero pounds per year back from the government. Um, when we're in that kind of situation uh, and we're told here is a pot of money from government level, several hundred billion pounds, which sounds like a, an absolutely huge number to the man or woman on the street, right? Mm. Or the person <coughs> on the street. Um, and then we're told what you've got to do is do your feasibility study and then put together a very detailed bid to access some of this money. And you might get it, but you might not. Now, that, that, isn't a really, um, that isn't a really encouraging way uh, to uh, inspire local governments to do its bit. And, of course, we all want to do our bit. The public sector wants to do its bit. But what we need is certainty, <coughs> because if we're putting resources into quite complex bids um, and, we're making, uh, and we're making the best that we possibly can of a really difficult situation, but we have no guarantee of anything coming back, um, that does, uh, it reduces confidence in the system, I think, um, and, and it's a real disincentive, albeit 
councils like Stroud and Cheltenham um, are, are, are blazing a trail. We're working together on bids for the Social Housing Decarbonisation Fund, for example, which we put a bid in for this week, which is a really positive um, bit of news because we need to retrofit lots of council houses. We've got about 4,500 in Cheltenham to do, um, and, and there's some interesting heat pump technology as well that's involved in that bid. Um, but what we need is certainty. We need certainty about where our funding is coming from. Uh, we need certainty about what we'll get in return for our bids. Um, and we need, uh, we need to know that we can plan to get X amount in year one, X amount in year two, X amount in year three. And then we can really start <coughs> to make effective long-term plans um, rather than having to do it in, in a rather piecemeal way, which I think um, is a check on those kind of detailed plans and strategies that we're all putting in place. <coughs> so, Martin, from your perspective, as, thank you, Max. From your perspective, as, as former police and crime commissioner, would it have been good that government and the Home Office told you to make the environment and sustainability a priority? Would that have helped you? I don't think it would have helped me. I, I can see in the local government set it, it would help. Um, I think it's very clear that the public expect this of their local authorities. Uh, probably the police is different, and the Ministry of Defence are different, because we're defined sectors. Um, everybody knows that we have to do it. And as I said, within these organisations where we deliver something like policing, like Ministry of Defence, like hospitals, there is more than just doctors, police officers and soldiers. There are huge procurement departments, there are huge building departments, and these are the people who say, you are, you are important. Our business, call it a business, is going to be sustainable, it's going to be cost effective, and it's certainly going to be um, neutral on, on, on the climate change, on CO2s. So that's where I think it is. I don't think <coughs> we need the government to tell us to do that because it is so clear it needs to be done. What it needs is people to show leadership and show by example. It doesn't mean just trying things out. I think the experimental stage is for industry, it is for government, it is for science, and there is so much out there. It takes people in those sectors to look at what is out there, talk to them at events like this and say, well, could that work for me? Um, the building next door we bought for the police is their training centre about two years ago. It's now the, the biggest training centre. And of course, it's like a blank canvas, except we were told by our, our people, uh, not directly for us to say it's cheaper and better to build a new one. It'll be more, um, it'll be better. Not, don't take an old building. Now that building is going to become an active building. It will take a few years to get that way. It's probably getting near to passive now with the solar panels going on the roof, the, the type of heat exchange it will have. But it can be done. So I think it shows leadership. I, I think people need to just treat it as a priority, a priority within the MOD to say we are going to contribute and we are going to be a responsible organisation with regards to net zero. Within the police as well, now most of it's all about crime, murders, uh, women against you know, you know, violence against women and girls, that's hugely important. But those organisations, as well as that, you know, we're quite clever. We can do other things. We can make this organisation an example. And we did in Gloucestershire, that getting the 20% the, the of vehicles actually saved us money. There were so many sceptics, but actually it saved us money. Uh, and going to 40% would probably save us money as well. So it, it can be done. What was shocking, I don't mean shock, horror, but we're just one police force. And no other police force in the country had done this. It's not because I'm brilliant <coughs> or we're brilliant, but it wasn't joined up. And, you know, we needed to be able to say across the whole of the South West, it's all interchangeable. We don't need to have one on one charging system, another on another system. We need to have good deals for servicing and the like of that. And we got to the stage where the, call it the back office, it's not the back office, the policing would work on three priorities. It would be on vehicles, it would be on estates and social value. And there was overwhelming support for that across the country. What we need now is to make sure we're held to account for it, or what, what the police service of the future needs to be held to account for that. And it should be something that everybody, you the public, expect of it. And if you've got a highly polluted police force, or a highly polluted Ministry of Defence, or health service, we should be able to have our say, it's not good enough. We want more than just short waiting lists and short waiting times. We want you to take care of our society. It's cross-cutting, that's my view. Government would be nice, but if you wait for the government to do things, it's, it doesn't, you might waste an awful long time. And there would be at least three different opinions. And this is no disrespect to my colleagues here. They're very, very collegiate, and, and I know that. They work together remarkably well. But there is something with party politics. I wasn't a party politician where people just like to find fault with each other. And it's not very good when it comes to climate change. 
where we should all be on the same page. Thank you, Martin. Picking up on uh, one of Martin's points there, John, for you, is Martin was about uniformity, you know, the, a certain standard with other forces maybe when it comes to, you know, what they're doing. What about the university sector? You know, what could the government do? Is it about setting targets for universities? Would that help? You're leading the way in Gloucestershire with this, aren't you? Um, that is a really good question. I'm going to preface it slightly with I've only worked in the university centre for 18 months, so I don't necessarily know all the answers there. What I do know is that there's an organisation called UUK, which is kind of the university's own body for representing itself, that has just sent its own targets around net zero and around, you know, the different scopes for net zero, but around scope one and two and having a target for that by 2035, I think, and then scope three, a sort of longer term target. So in a way, I think the university sector does tend to have an easier way of working together because because of the type of people involved, I suppose, and because of the way the system's been set up. So there is, I don't think we necessarily need national targets from the government on that. I think actually the sector's been quite good at policing itself. I think there are a couple of points that you both mentioned that are worth picking up on anyway, which is about that connectedness. I think, again, the universities are connected, but we know we can't do it on our own. So, so taking our actual example with that 40% of our emissions coming from the commute, we can't individually solve that. We can solve that as a community and as a county, perhaps. And some of the things that, that Max mentioned already that are already helping us are things like Cheltenham Zero. So it is a voluntary kind of club in a way, isn't it? But it does enable organisations that weren't connected before to start having those important conversations. So it's and it's helped also by the councils taking on some more people that are doing climate change stuff. So there's two, two new people in the team at Chelton Borough Council that, are, that through Chelton and Zero, we've already made good connections with and we can work together with. And then it's also enabled us to start talking to places like GCHQ. So they're on the other side of Cheltenham from most of our campuses, but they're in between our main campuses and Oxdorf's campus. And they have a similar demographic of employees and they have a similar number if you add our students into the equation. And they all want to try and encourage their teams to come to work by bus. So we, Cheltenham Zero has helped with that as well. I think that that's where government and local government can help is just by helping make those connections. Um, the other thing, and I think it picks up on something that people have said already, is around the funding part of it. And I think something does need to change there. So it's great that, that the current government has put money into it. There was what was called the Public Sector Decarbonisation Scheme number one, which had, I think, a billion pounds in it. Then there was scheme number two, which had 75 million. Literally 10 days, no, what is it now? Two weeks ago, yes, two weeks ago, they launched scheme three, which has an unknown amount in it, and you won't know if you're successful till January. So that doesn't really help with your planning necessarily. But one part of that process is, again, you're competing with equally viable and equally um, you know, deserving organisations. And that system is a first come, first served one. So basically all it's done is after the first round where everyone suddenly found out what first come, first served meant, it means now when the portal or the website opens, it's basically the fastest typist wins. <laughs> so you've kind of got to get your grant application in within, so, we got ours within, in within two hours of it opening, but we don't know how much is in that fund. The last fund and we didn't know how much was in, I got it in 24 hours after it opened and it had already exceeded the funding by 200%. So you've got to be really, really quick. And that's not driving the right behaviours. That's just driving, you know, poor applications or very, very, very quick typing, which I'm not good at. So uh, from my point of view, though, really the one is, is helping make those connections. I think that that's the one that, doesn't necessarily involve spend. And, and my view on the spend is really, if grants are given out and funding is given out, ultimately the only place that money comes from, and this was a, one of the topics earlier, we've all got to be honest, ultimately if it's government funding, the only place it's going to come from is us in the end. Because it's either going to be through tax paying or it's going to be through paying more prices for the services we use because the company we're buying it from is going to be taxed differently as well. I, I don't see there's another revenue stream for that. I might be not a specialist, I might be wrong. So I, th I think that's kind of where it sits. Diana, following on from that, and so for you, in terms of what the what can the government do? Is it just about money for you? I mean, it would be great. You know, you've got five thousand council homes need retrofitting, one hundred and eighty million. You said you want the money. Is that what it would help? 
it would help. Yeah, it would. And I think you've probably got a common theme going on here. What we want is long-term security around funding and not this bid process. I mean, that just sounds really heartbreaking, what you had to go through there. And similarly, so I think what we would need, we've got the local government settlement coming up soon. We should have sort of a clear financial settlement for, for that sector, sort of that we c which would be around the carbon um, reduction sort of targets. But it, and there are some really interesting... I'm not an expert either, but I think around what you're mentioning about green finance, there probably are some really interesting ideas around there. It's not about just um, putting the burden on taxpayers, but it isn't simply around um, the finance. And I was thinking we need to reflect on the learning we've had through living through a pandemic. We declared mm -hmm. an emergency in 2018, and I was thinking um, when we decided to do it, well, actually, I have no idea what we're doing. What does an emergency mean? And then a real emergency came, which was COVID. And we all, I mean, I can only speak for our council. I mean, how we stepped up, actually, local government across the board and the public sector generally stepped up into such a challenging time and actually just completely turned things around and worked in a completely different way. And so over the last 18 months, we've actually understood what it means to work and, and operate within a real emergency. Can we learn from that? Because we're not actually operating as regards responding to the climate in the same way. And I think um, another thing I was thinking about as you were talking, I was reflecting, you said maybe not about having imposed targets, but we've lived with data for the last 18 months. We've been obsessed with case numbers, haven't we, and deaths and hospitalizations. And so we're very used to that. And I think what we don't really have uh, um, for, for a country is we have, we talk about carbon emissions, and we, some people probably who know will have an idea where they are, but actually, why don't we actually have government should put its resources into actually demonstrating every part of the country, well, what emissions do you have and how do you then start to bring them down? So we should, we should have that sort of data that we could see um, so we can actually, and that would help, I think, with people coming on board to visualise within your town, within your city, within your, your county, what actually it means and how you would, with something idea we've actually floated around in the Stroud District, how we would contribute to actually starting to bring it down so they're all actively engaged with that. So I think it's not just about finance. So those are things that the government would have the instruments at its disposal to start to happen. And the other thing I would like to say is around what government could, should, needs to take on board. I think, again, that's learning from the, from the COVID pandemic, is that if you recall in the early stages when they thought they'd have to bring in quite severe restrictions, there was a feeling that people wouldn't take it. And actually people took it really well. And the communities that came together and actually tolerated some horrendous restrictions for the greater good was actually far in excess of what people had expected. And many people talked about that as quite a positive outcome. And I think what we all feel as politicians in our communities is people are ready. People keep talking about the fact well, people won't want to accept um, you know, difficulties or, or changes because of, of the, the climate emergency and how we'd have to respond to that. But what I feel is there's a huge appetite out there for the public for us to go further, but government needs to be the one that sets that in place. And when I look at the strategy, it feels to me it's all about, well, only if you really need to, you can just choose if you do or not. And so it still isn't quite being brave enough to take that step and say, actually, we do need to do this and we're going to do this. And I think people will come with, with them because a bit we haven't talked about very much, but something we and I think you mentioned it a bit, as we're conscious that we you know how do we bring the community with us and how do we engage with people and that's again we're looking to do a similar thing a governance that we've got in place so that community engagement we've got it's also got to be diverse it's got to represent our communities I think I've been involved in working and campaigning on climate change um, within this area for well, 10 plus years now and it felt sometimes like you're talking to the same sort of people but I think what we now know is it needs to be representing everyone in the community we need to reach out to the hard to reach communities as well so um, so I think there's a few ideas there that hopefully um, you know, will give people food for thought. It's not just about money, but I have to say money is absolutely crucial. Uh, and the m sums of money that we need to see, if we're really, really serious about this, are quite eye-watering. But we need to start to grasp that nettle. We really need to get on with it because we're not going to get mm -hmm. any, significant, any significant change unless we really start to engage with what we need. And there's some really good work, like, for example, the New Economics Foundation have done this thing. I can't remember what it's called now, but it's around housing um, and sort of... I wish I could remember the title of the thing, but it's around, they've sort of identified the sums that would be needed, and work has been done. The data is there to tell us what we need, so government needs to engage with those sums, I think, because they're actually quite significant, but that's where you're going to get the, the, the impact um, if you really want that to happen. John, I'm going to follow on with that about the issue of education, because, you know, we see in, in the papers, you'll have myths about heat source pumps, and hydrogen boilers are the answer, and, you know, this is the answer here, and... Is it, does it come down to education and a bit of myth busting is needed to educate people that it, it's not going to be a well, you know, one, fit, one size fits all solution, it is a myriad of options and I think, is it down to education to lead the way on this one? I could just go yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, th I think you're kind of right. I think that um, you know, it's, 
I was thinking that earlier about another conversation we were having as well, that actually most, it, the audience here is slightly self-selecting. So actually, that I'm guessing everybody in the room at least is aware of the issue and cares about it. A lot of people don't, and, and that's not down to them really being ignorant. It's around the information being out there and the people having capacity to spend the time to actually understand what the problem could mean. And perhaps it's partly about really explaining to people what what the UK could be like if climate change does happen. Because there's a lot of sort of stories about there, there's a lot of doom and gloom, and it could be completely correct. It is avoidable, definitely. And I think you've got to give people that hope. But I, I think that, you know, if, if I went, for instance, to my parents and said, you know, I think you should replace your gas boiler, boiler with an air source heat pump, their first question would be, don't even know what an air source heat pump is. And, and do they need to know? Maybe not. But do they need to know why they want to change it? They should do. And I think there is, so there's education for everyone. There's education that we deliver as part of the courses in, in the kind of whole world of the big world of sustainability. But we're only delivering that to, I think we have 8,000 students. So, you know, that's, so every year in effect, there's about two and a half thousand students coming out the end of the pipe. That's not a lot. You know, there's, there's a lot of people to educate and we need to make it understandable education. So I think that when we're talking about it in, you know, in the big picture for all of us at home, do we in the room know what we would need to do for our own household to do our bit to avoid climate change? You can do a show of hands if you like. Does everybody think they know or do you? So that's kind of, actually, that's probably more than I would have guessed. So that's great. So it's obviously more effective than I thought. I think the answer is significantly increase my income. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I think quite possibly it is, actually, yes. But doesn't yeah. that pick up on the point that actually the public are seemingly more aware now? And we are at a bit of a... I think a we're at crossroads. We are. Yeah. I think we are. Yeah. I mean, yeah. and don't you, do you feel that as councillors, that the public are there more or less now? The climate change deniers seem to have gone off the news now, and it's more a case of what we're going to do then. Yeah rather than it's not happening. Can I say, I mean, I, but we make, it's so difficult for people. You know, I live in a, a mixture of rural district of, of towns and the bus service isn't good. I know, you know, not recently they just stopped um, the buses going to the local railway station. So I've got people in the town who say, well, I cannot get to the bus station anymore. And, you know, I would love to go. I don't want to drive my car, but I cannot do it. So we just make people's lives too difficult to make them enable to make the changes. And that's where the politicians have to come in. You need to make the bus services run. You've got to make train travel. I mean, it costs like, you know, I don't, 20 pounds to fly to, to Glasgow go but probably a hundred pounds plus to go on the train so you know we do, we're doing everything we can to make people not f help them make the choices and I think that's where we, you know we need to be making those decisions because people want to do it but it's very hard for them to we're not enabling them mm. to help them they, they want to but they can't because it's just impossible I think there's a point here about um, what people see and do in their day-to-day -day lives and how that actually translate to, to uh, translates to what we're asking them to do um, and while there's more people who have moved along the bell curve and now understand and want to get involved in things, and it's not just the same dozen or so people in Cheltenham that I see going to every single meeting, there's a bigger, a bigger group, uh, including some of the people in the room today. Um, actually, uh, the understanding of what people might need to do um, and how uh, we communicate that to, to people as politicians is really interesting. Uh, and what are the touch points that can actually get people to change their behaviours? Because large-scale behaviour change is needed. Mm -hmm. um, you, you mentioned buses and transport there, and I think that's a really instructive example. Um, the, uh, the often quoted statistic in Cheltenham is that 70% uh, of our car journeys are below two kilometres, which for, uh, for a healthy person um, is, uh, is a, a very walkable distance or a cyclable distance if we had a cycle network in Cheltenham. Um, and we've put forward the Connecting Cheltenham report to try to influence um, others at the Highways Authority to say that this is a thing that we could easily do here. You know, we, could have, we can have active travel networks, we can, we can have pedestrian friendly streets. Um, but if at the moment we went to people in Cheltenham and said, get on your bike or walk to work, they'd probably go, well, it's quite an unpleasant experience and I'm walking, I'm walking through lots of traffic and there's lots of pollution in the air. So there's, uh, there is a way in which we can, I think, make that, um, make that discussion a bit more tangible for people and, and get, uh, get to some of those emotional touch points by uh, talking about public health. Because everyone cares about the health of their children, everyone cares mm. about their own health. Um, uh, and I think when we're talking about these kind of things, if we're tying it into public health and the public health outcomes that we can get and the way we can protect the NHS, as we heard at length during the pandemic, um, by walking or cycling or, or just simply dropping our car journeys or uh, changing to EV or taking the bus instead, um, that is another way in which we can make a more powerful argument to some of those people who perhaps 
are, aren't making that direct link between um, their actions uh, and negative outcomes for the environment. Uh, and I think there is actually um, spilling out of that. There are there are things in which we, that we can do when we put our policies in place. So, for example. Um, and people don't really like the idea of hypothecated taxes or hypothecated revenues. But for example, when we're making money from our car parks, why can't we then ring fence some of that money and say, when you park your car here, you're paying ten pound, uh, sorry, ten pounds a day or ten p uh, an hour more, uh, and we're going to put this um, into a fund that pays for something positive. It could be trees. That's the easy answer that everyone likes, trees. But it could, it could be something different. It could be public awareness campaigns. It could be something tangible. Um, it could be biodiversity. Uh, it, it could be anything, really. It could even be a network of cycle lanes. Um, but you know, th th I think there are ways in which we can make the case and ways in which we can put policies in place um, that, make, th that make, the, uh, make it much more obvious um, for uh, the, the regular folks who have not self-selected and turned up to uh, today's debate. I, I, think, I think Max is absolutely right. I personally don't think we're going to scare the public into uh, action mm -hmm. because by the time they actually physically see it, it'll be too late. Uh, so I just don't think we will. But a lot of the change is good. You know, I don't think people like pollution, so that's a good reason to perhaps go electric. I don't think people like to see polluted rivers because they want to use them to, to swim or sail on. I think it, it, there's so much the public would like about this. And there is a real sell in it, uh, you know, as, as industry, the electric cars are good. The, probably the way we turned it into police was to get a Tesla, uh, one of the, the really super fast ones, and give it to the, the, the biggest suits in the world. They're brilliant, but the traffic police, you know, they are, the police are cynical. So here you've got this for a week. We, we persuaded Tesla to give us for a week. And all of a sudden there's, hey, these are really good. These are Ferrari fast. They like that. And I can tell you now, we had a phone call from Tesla because Big Brother is out there saying, who the hell's got our Tesla? Because it's just doing 140 miles an hour down the motorway or something like that. It's okay, it's the police, don't worry. <laughs> but, don't <laughs> but it changed it from a, a kind of like, the commissioner's a bit quirky, he's got that funny shape, that's the leak, which he drives. It wasn't, I didn't pay for it, it's a company one. But those kind of things, it can be fun. Um, so it's really selling to the public. It's good. You know, I want my children to live up, like they would have grown up, in a safe environment. I want them to have a clean environment. We all like that, you know. We don't want dirty, filthy factories and polluted rivers and estuaries. So, but I, I really don't think any amount, I may be wrong, that we are going to scare people in to say, you know, oh, we're all going to drown here in, in 100 years' time or less, even if it's probably true. Do we need a public service education campaign then, do we? You know, former journos, is, is it a public service, you know, broadcast kind of campaign? Well, I'm really interested in the message that we give out as, um, as people who are involved in the public sector and politics, because I think it needs to be one of hope. John mentioned hope earlier on, I think, mm -hmm. uh, and that's really important because you've got to paint the picture of a future that people want to live in rather than saying you can't have steak. Um, for example, or you can't eat kebab and you can't drive the, the fast car that you like. Mm. So that, that, that's really important. Just to pick up on the, the point about you know, everyone dying and flooding in 100 years' time, right? one of the really important points is that we set targets that are so close that people actually have to do something. Because uh, a point I, I had written in my general notes here was that um, you know, the government's target is 2050. Most local councils have set targets for much closer than that. Oh. I know that if I'd walked into Cheltenham Council and said, we'll set a target for 2050 of carbon neutrality, they'd have gone, oh, well, that's nice, we'll put a plan in place. Um, and nothing would have happened for a very long time because everyone knows that by 2050 that you know, most of the councillors on Cheltenham Borough Council will be dead um, <laughs> and most of the officers will have retired or they will be dead too. I will even be old and I'm among the younger councillors. Um, I'm only 37. Um, but you know, th th this is a really important point, right? Yeah. The, the message needs to be that it, it is an emergency and it is urgent and targets need to be close. Mm -hmm. And then... You say, but when we get to that target, which is quite close, you'll have clean streets, you'll have more trees, you'll have more animals and birds to look at, you'll have a nicer life, your children will have fewer respiratory problems, you'll be healthier, you'll, uh, you, know, you won't see quite so many people um, clogging up the NHS because they've got problems with obesity. Mm. It's all of, these, all of these points that I think we, um, we need to paint as politicians, just to, to paint that sort of positive a vision of the future so we can say actually this is something that's worth having and it's not just kind of intangible and and doom and gloom and everyone's going to die and i think part of that though is that that storytelling part because quite often people even in the workplace as well and not just in net zero in, in everything when they hit the first barrier or block quite often people just kind of stop because they don't feel empowered to 
to raise it as a question or to resolve it or to find a way around it. But telling those stories around, you know, even how you would get the message out of putting 10p on the parking price, how you successfully did that and got around the barrier, but then also how how that money is then used to remove a different block or barrier somewhere else. That's that's probably part of the secret as well around that touch on the education bit around this is a successful way of just not just going, oh, it's a problem, oh, I've hit a barrier, oh, I don't know what to do, I'm going to stop, but I've hit a barrier, I'll think of something different. Or sometimes in the, pri in the public sector, it's, oh, I'm scared of the private sector and I don't want to work with them just in case they might make a quick buck. And we know we don't have the capacity or the resources to actually deliver that service. Um, and sometimes that is the problem. Mm. In the do do we really have to convince people, you know, by saying it's 10p for this? Can't we just get the message out? This is mainstream now. This is what we do. You know, our council, I'm not knocking you, by the way. This, this is what we do. We don't say, hey, this is 10p for this, for that. This is probably the most important thing. The public mm. should expect, we say, well, hang on, out of my general taxation, why on earth isn't this mainstreamed? Uh, and in so many of the things that I, I used to get tired of when I was commissioner, so, well, we're on a pilot project. I said, why? Because this has been researched for the last 30 years. Why? If you think it's that good, we don't need another pilot study. Just commit to it or bin it. Uh, it was around restorative justice, they said straight away, can we have a pilot project to test restorative justice? That began in the 70s. Either you like it or you don't. And if you're really committed to it, put the money aside and do it. Otherwise, go away. And that's what they did. They, they did it. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and I think the same for, for climate change and for the environment. You shouldn't, I, I respect what you do, and I'm not saying you shouldn't do it, but saying that the, the council should be carbon neutral should be a given and it should be why on earth aren't you doing this you know rather than you have to explain it by it's a surcharge it's not it should be a surcharge for doing something stupid you know like if you really want to do that that's 10p extra you know you want to have a particularly wide gas guzzling car um, you know which you park on the pavement well you're, we're going <laughs> to you know what i'm talking about uh, <laughs> you're, we're going to charge you a pound extra because you're a nuisance mm. but to do the right thing should be mainstreamed I don't want to be charged yet just for doing the right thing. Can I say, we're coming back, we're talking quite a lot about communications, and I think it's a point that I made very early on when I spoke first, was around, you know, uh, one thing that was strengthened through COVID was around this pride of place where we live because we couldn't travel anywhere. And I think that's also, going back to what you're saying about where you're going to put the funding, is that people care about where they live, and that is something quite fundamental to them, regardless of where they are. And I think you can use that as a way into discussing some of those things. But I think the other thing we have to bear in mind is public sector. We've got a day job to do, and we need to get that golden thread of climate all the way through. But actually, we've got to empty the bins, and we've got to do all the basic stuff as well as all of this yeah. without the extra funding without the extra powers so we're already doing a huge amount we've got to add all this on top and somehow incorporate it into a whole whole mm. picture that we're delivering so i think that's really important but i think um i think we also have to bear in mind that particularly going into this autumn and winter there are many people out there who are just struggling to even go and pay for, for the food that they need to eat they're making that choice between eating and heating so for many people they're just dealing with the basics so I think I said about social justice has got to be a part of that as well we've got to recognize that for people at the moment many of them they're living in extremely challenging times and some of this may feel very remote from their own lives so I again our job is to communicate that actually is relevant and what we should be doing is taking people at the bottom and through the carbon emissions like about you know retrofitting council homes we just take them out I mean my aspiration would be that if people below a certain income do not pay energy bills you know that should be free like education and the health service I think why should people have to pay for energy there's enough renewable energy out there and that e isn't even an aspiration we seem to be aiming for at the moment so I think we need to look at it from that um, angle as well I think the barriers that we talked about at the beginning that's one element of it how do we make people feel like this is relevant in their lives because as you said climate change feels very remote mm. but actually they are themselves going to be impacted and probably the people at the bottom will be the most severely un impacted, unfortunately. Quick uh, yes and no questions before we wrap up. Um, so are we saying the public sector has an important role to play? Yes. Absolutely, yep. yes. 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 <laughs> easy one, that was an easy essential, one. Essential, <laughs> essential. Yep. Uh, the, ne the next one, I suppose, is, you know, in terms of uh, public, public awareness campaign, do we need a national public awareness campaign that is telling people and informing people? I, I would like to say uh, yes, with the, with the kicker, um, that it has to be um, tying it into something else that will uh, gather up those people who perhaps won't um, necessarily respond to a doom and gloom 
uh, climate change message. I actually really That's like the problem. radical idea that Doyne has just put forward. Um, and you know, no one pay, no one below uh, yeah. certain I in income thresholds pays energy bills is uh, a really saleable policy. And I don't know why anyone in any political party or independent, for that matter, wouldn't uh, wouldn't have subscribed to that. Mm. I'd say no to a national thing. It should be local to okay. people where they live and br done by people that they know in their community. That's the way it would resonate with people. Okay. You know, a remote Westminster campaign isn't going to cut the ice. I think. No, we don't want Boris Johnson in front no, of it. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Martin and John? I don't care who friends it, but, um, well, I do. But <laughs> I, I think it's for industry, I think it's for the, for the for poli central government, local government, for every, everybody, mm. to have, not to a campaign to scare people, but some of these technologies are just really good. Uh, you know, if there wasn't a climate change in the emergency, they're still good technologies, most of them. So I think we should be promoting the benefits of you know the of, of these new technologies john yes or no <laughs> yes yes good <laughs> well done. right then final wrap-up question for you you each have um 30 seconds i'd say with boris johnson in the room what do you want him to do for from cop john 30 seconds with him what do you tell him deliver a firm commitment to prevent climate change thank you martin tell the truth thank you <laughs> push back against the fossil fuel industries that are lobbying hard to get us to ra ratchet back on our ambitions max uh, I agree with all those three things and I would also say just give local areas uh, the powers and the funding that they need to make a difference in their communities in line with all the climate emergency declarations that we've made. My thanks to Dr John Furley, uh, Sustainability Operations Manager at the University of Gloucestershire, Martin Searle, former Police and Crime Commissioner for Gloucestershire, Dona Cornell, the Labour and Cooperative Leader of Stroud District Council, Max Wilkinson, the Climate Change Cabinet Member for Cheltenham Borough Council. You've been watching a Active Building Centre hosted event uh, in association with Stroud District Council. Thank you. Yeah.